Okay, Keith Tier here, welcome to That Was The Week. It is the 17th of September, and there is no Andrew Keane this week at all. And I'm missing Andrew, he's in Kazakhstan. Um, but we took the opportunity this week to do something a little bit different, which is what you might think of as a video essay with yours truly. So here I am. This week's That Was The Week, is entitled Venture Capital Deep Dive. And um, it's got some fantastic writing in it, um, really, really good writing that looks at all aspects of what hap is happening in, in venture capital, a uh, topic that we have been uh, talking about a lot on That Was The Week. And um, this week, let's just stand back and just look at, um, at and survey venture capital. Um, I want to start with, um, with uh, an article written by Jack Abramowitz. Jack is, um, um, uh, he's at Next View Ventures, and um, he wrote an article called State of VC 2.0. And <clears throat> I'm, pulling, I'm going to pull out two or three quotes from him. First one is this, are we also enjoying a period of unparalleled growth and opportunity led by high growth technology companies? Question. Probably, yes, as well. We see this from the performance of the public markets, the absolute numbers generated by the venture industry. It, it may be overinflated, but it's hard to deny that there is some really serious value creation that is happening in these sectors. In other words, um, uh, and we know this because there's over 400 unicorns this year, a, a large number of companies are growing fast, really fast, getting big, faster than ever before, raising more money than ever before um, uh, from a wider range of investors than ever before. Um, so it, it, it kind of looks as if just everything is wonderful. And uh, what Jack does um, is he kind of steps back from that and says, well, to be honest, VC is really not that great of an asset class unless you're an investor in the very best funds. He draws his conclusion by comparing venture to uh, the S&P 500 over a long period of time. The absolute return numbers might look respectable at the moment, but they still far lag the market overall. And there is some reason to be a little skeptical of very high, I'll explain this in a minute, TVPI numbers from funds that haven't sent home significant distributions as there is a long record of DPI, I'll explain that as well, not catching up to TVPI. So what, what is Jack saying here? TVPI stands for total value uh, to paid in capital. So if, if a venture fund uh, raises 100 million and the total value of its fund today, let's say five years later, is uh, 120 million, then it's, uh, it's TVPI is is 1.2 um, uh, but it's a measure of the underlying value of the companies they've invested in which are which are still private and so that value is expressed in stock owned in those companies therefore not liquid so tv vpi is a illiquid measure of value driven by your investing dpi stands for distributed um, to paid in capital, distributions to paid in capital. That is actual dollars that you sent back to your investors. And the point he's making here is that uh, most funds have very, very um, uh, wide ratio between TVPI and DPI. That is to say, most of their investments are, are not liquid. Uh, and that's true even for the best funds. Um, and unless you are in the best funds, you're probably both illiquid and getting uh, low returns, returns lower than the stock market uh, would give you if you just uh, invest in an index fund. So that, 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 uh, that is true. Um, and uh, it focuses in on, on the realities of venture capital. The key takeaway, says Jack, is that it seems like the top of the pack is moving further away from the rest and the power law of venture capital is increasing. Even though it seems like everyone in the industry is thriving, it's actually a relatively small number of companies that are really accumulating massive value and the owners of those companies are the ones that are really outperforming. 
So um, uh, uh, you have to read his article. It's it's a, a, an essay and it's long and it's really well thought through. But the point he's making there is that the gap between the top 5% of investors in early stage companies and the rest is widening and accelerating. Uh, and that even, even for the, those top 5%, illiquidity is um, is what dominates uh, the landscape uh, last week I you, I added a, a, a mark Suster article in the in the newsletter and we didn't really talk about it in any great detail so I've, I've included it this week as well just because it really belongs in this set of articles um, this is mark uh, talking about how different today is than uh, than venture used to be a seed round these days is three to five million or more, and there is so much more money around being thrown at so many entrepreneurs that many firms don't even care about board seats, governance rights, or heaven forbid, doing work with a company, because that would eat into the VC's time needed to chase five more deals. Seed has become an option factory for many, and the truth is that several entrepreneurs, uh, that several entrepreneurs prefer it this way. Now, you could say there's a little bit of bitterness in that from Mark, but he is describing reality. And the reality is that um, the valuation of C stage companies has gone up. The due diligence uh, has gone down as it's become more competitive to get into them. Um, and the amount of money they can raise uh, is increasing, as, as it is at the A round. Here he makes the point that A rounds used to be three to seven million, with the best companies able to skip this small amount and maybe raise 10 on a 40 million pre-money valuation. Um, these days, 10 million is quaint for the best day rounds, and many are raising 20 with a 60 to 80 million pre-money valuation or greater. So, you know, this, uh, so we have the seed stage and we have um, the, the A stage. Uh, it's worth sharing my screen here and showing you uh, a little chart that Mark includes in his email. Uh, let's put that on now. Uh, this is this is comparing 2001, 2011, and 2021, where he talks about um, it used to be the case that you get some startup capital, then do a Series A, and then do a Series B, and maybe exit. Uh, today, uh, you start with an incubator, accelerator, maybe somewhere between 250k and 750k. You do a pre-seed round, you do a seed round, then you might do a Series A. Uh, uh, and then a B or a C and a D uh, uh, through an F and exit. In other words, a lot more rounds. Um, and so uh, these increases in valuation um, all, uh, disguise a much more difficult landscape uh, that, uh, that has to be navigated by companies. Uh, but, you know, he's still right. He's still right that uh, we are living in a, in a time when um, valuations are, are very, very high. Um, he then goes on to, uh, to talk about uh, his own fund and how they navigate their landscape. And I think this is, he's, he's dealing with a set of problems that every venture fund that invests early stage deals with. He says, we're very unlikely to do what people now call an A round. Why? Because to invest at a 60 to an 80 million pre-money valuation or even a 40 to 50 before there is enough evidence of success requires a larger fund. If you're going to play in the big leagues, you need to be writing checks from a 700 million to 1 billion fund. And therefore, a 20 million um, is just 2 to 5% of the fund. We try to cap our A rounds at around 300 million, our fund, sorry, at around 300 million. So we retain the discipline to invest early and small while building our own growth platform separately uh, to do late stage deals. What we promise to entrepreneurs is that if we're in for three to four million and things are going well, but you just need more time to prove out your business, at this scale, it's easier for us to help you find uh, to fund a seed extension. That's one of the rounds that he mentions. These extensions are much less likely at the next level. Capital is a lot less patient at scale. So Mark's basically selling his approach to investing as um, um, 
going against the market, actually. Uh, the market's rising and he's saying, no, we're staying disciplined. We're, we're trying to keep valuations in check early uh, and be very engaged with our companies. Uh, but we will, you know, uh, the other side, if the company breaks through, we will do growth stage investing uh, later and uh, we'll miss out uh, the little bit in the middle that's high risk. I personally think that is a mistake. I, I don't think that's going to work, but um, but I think it's great that Mark is articulating the problem. Um, this is this is Mark saying something that I do agree with. Uh, he, he recalls that um, years ago, Scott Cooper, who is uh, Andreessen Horowitz, was telling me that the market would split into bulge bracket VCs and specialized smaller early stage firms. And the middle ground would be gutted. That's what we've been saying here on That Was The Week for quite a long time. At the time, I wasn't 100% sure, but he made a compelling argument about how other markets have developed as they matured. So I took note. He also wrote this excellent book. So Scott, it turns out, is entirely right. Um, Mark is being forced to move from being an A-round fund to a seed fund again. Uh, that's happening to pretty much all of the micro VCs are becoming seed funds. The average seed size check is growing and um, they are having to navigate uh, when their companies really take off. They're having to navigate how to keep putting capital into those companies so as not to be diluted down to a very small uh, holding. That is an accurate summary of, of what's going on in the market. Um, now, at the, at, at the end of the day, even when you play the game well, um, you end up with with this scenario. Uh, this is uh, taken from the investor deck of Forge Global, which announced this week that it's doing a SPAC at a valuation of $2 billion. Forge Global specializes in uh, the secondary market for private company shares. And the point uh, that it's making here is that it takes roughly 12 years these days for a company go, to go public. And when they do, their valuation is typically around $4 billion. It then shows that the, the um, number and, and, and the market size of unicorns has grown um, massively. So most of, uh, most of the uh, growth in unicorns is reflected there in the orange. But again, in the, f in the bottom right-hand corner, most of the unicorns are still private companies, about, about $17 trillion worth, $17 to $19 trillion worth of private companies. So... Um, if you're an LP investor in a fund that does well, you're still going to be illiquid. And that's really the second problem that this week's articles are, are talking about. Um, there's a great article by, um, by Draw Poleg, uh, not a name I've heard before, but Draw writes an article about Andreessen Horowitz. And... Um, he makes uh, the following point. He says, the, the, the world is awash with capital, and even the most conservative institutional and retail investors are developing an appetite for riskier bets. This is driven by, one, historically low interest rates, and two, the winner-takes-all nature of many technology-powered businesses. In other words, you are guaranteed to lose purchasing power if you keep your money in safe assets and a handful of extremely successful investments capture most of the available returns. Investors who try to stay safe or even take risks but miss out on the biggest winners end up far behind. Again, talking about how hard it is to be good at VC. You need to be in the top 5%. He then talks about Andreessen Horowitz. How do you compete in such a world? Well, you think strategically. In the case of venture capital, that means doing things your competitors are not doing which is exactly what Andreessen Horowitz is doing. The firm is on a hiring spree, recruiting new partners and, forming, and, and former government officials, writers, editors, and more. A16Z is no longer building a venture capital firm. It is building a new type of company with a thick management layer that helps support its multiple portfolio companies with marketing, legal, lobbying, and technical resources. It's no longer venture capital. It's a venture corporation. Now that, that is, uh, that is a, a big statement that um, we're moving from a world of funds, venture capital funds, to venture capital corporations. That's Scott Cooper's point, by the way, that if you're big, you've got to get bigger and do things in, in a way that fits the market better. 
The only problem with this, says Draw, is that it costs a lot of money. Doing all these new things and staffing all these new departments is expensive. Does it mean that Andreessen will soon go bust? Not at all. Andreessen is taking a page out of Amazon's book. Jeff Bezos famously said, your margin is my opportunity, highlighting his willingness to minimize his short and even medium-term profits for the sake of long-term ones. For years, Amazon operated at a loss or near loss, investing its free cash into infrastructure, new business lines, and various other things that looked like a distraction for a website that sells stuff. Over the long term, these investments did not just enable Amazon to ultimately become profitable, they enabled Amazon to become the biggest winner in several giant markets with strong winner-takes-all dynamics, online commerce, cloud computing, and soon third-party logistics. More importantly, Amazon didn't just win, it completely changed the economics of online commerce and forced its competitors to take on new costs and new activities in order to remain relevant. Other retailers are now forced to catch up with Amazon's various activities or become dependent on partnerships with companies such as Shopify, Facebook, and Stripe. So basically the point that, um, that Draw is making there is that um, investing at scale to disrupt an industry makes sense. And venture capital is not immune from that. And Andreessen is certainly playing that game. A16Z is doing the same thing to the venture capital industry. It's not just acting strategically in order to gain advantage. It's imposing a whole new cost structure on its competitors. As a result, a handful of other firms will try to catch up and become equally giant. A variety of boutique angel investors and syndicates will live off relatively small and absolutely large crumbs. And many of the big but not big enough funds that currently exist will disappear or gradually become irrelevant. So there you have it. Um, you've got a, a massive growth in venture capital, a massive rise in valuations at the early stage, uh, an inability of those early stage funds to play in the big, in the big leagues and th thus uh, you know, repositioning re, uh, themselves as seed investors. But with very large uh, rounds being done later stage, they of course get systematically diluted uh, in their most successful companies, um, thus limiting uh, their returns. And even then, the returns are largely not liquid. They're, they're private companies, um, not public companies. Uh, they stay private and they don't get acquired. Um, the vast majority of the unicorns are, are in that position. So, so um, what is to be done? Um, is, is an ongoing conversation uh, in the VC industry. Now, if, if you're a, a limited partner in VC funds, you really want two things. You want to get access to the best deals and you want uh, liquidity. Those are, those are two really, really important things for you. So this week's editorial um, is all about that. Uh, after summarizing uh, the articles, um, I talk a lot about what I am going to be doing next at Singlerank Corporation. Singlerank Corporation, by the way, let's just go there, is my new startup. Um, and it is a venture tech disruptor. Uh, the plan is to allocate capital at scale into the best uh, seed stage companies through the best managers and to use data analytics and data science to, um, to help with that, that allocation uh, by being a, a publicly listed venture corporation, not a venture fund, to, through our shares, provide our investors with liquidity across a large and uh, very valuable portfolio of private companies. So we are we are close to announcing our seed round. Um, uh, there's a contact form there on the website if you want to know more about what we're doing. And uh, as you can tell from this week's That Was The Week, um, it is highly relevant to what is happening in the world of venture capital. That said, uh, I would like to thank you for listening. Wish you all the best. And see you next week when Andrew will be back.
Goodbye.